If you're like most people, you've probably had the thought that this marketing caper messes with our brains, forcing us to buy things we didn't even know we needed. Guess what? You may well be right, but don't take my word for it. Listen to what world-leading neuromarketer Professor Prince Gooman has to say about it. It's a mind f- of an episode 540 of the 12-year-old, award-winning, small business, big marketing podcast. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Reed. And welcome back to your weekly dose of neuromarketing. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. Should be Professor Timbo Reed, really, shouldn't it? <laughs> but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire that it absolutely deserves to be. And that's exactly why this podcast exists. So if you love it, hit the subscribe button now and be that cool kid on the block who gets all their episodes delivered first. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever wondered why all watch ads show 10 past 10 as the time? Or why the McDonald's and Hungry Jack's logos are red and yellow? Or maybe you're ever so slightly perplexed as to why certain stores always appear to be on sale. Well, wonder no more. As Professor of Marketing at San Francisco's Holt Business School and author of the new marketing bestseller Blindsight, Prince Gooman, Professor Prince Gooman actually, explains with a bucket load of examples relevant to us small business owners how this treacherous world of marketing actually reshapes our brains. <laughs> Scary. I started off by asking Prince if there really are marketers in boardrooms all over the world plotting and planning to get inside our heads. Matt, that's a loaded question. The short answer is for certain companies who can afford to understand what happens in our heads, yes. There are neuroscientists, there are social psychologists and regular psychologists that are hired that work hand in hand with, with companies. And, you know, sometimes it's bad and I'm using quotes, if you can see me, and sometimes it's actually to connect better with the consumers. And, and that's part of what they do. You know, I've, I've been the marketing manager for Australia's largest travel company. I've worked in large advertising agencies. And I must say, naively, that I've never come across the term neuromarketing. So clearly it's new and clearly it's for the higher end boardrooms. But I know that what we're going to talk about today absolutely applies to the smaller end of town. What is neuromarketing? Neuromarketing is the application of neuroscience to marketing, really the application of neuroscience to engagement. And it does bleed over to sales and product and all sorts of stuff. And, and, and although you're right, it is, it is for the McDonald's and the Coca-Cola's currently, but it does not absolutely have to be that way. In fact, you know, the reason behind uh, me writing Blindsight, it was a first and foremost for the marketers in the room. It's not to vilify marketers, but actually to show you very intentional use of neuroscience and frankly, sometimes unintentional use of neuroscience for everyone. So, okay. So just explain neuroscience then. Yeah. Neuroscience is looking, looking at the brain and, and to understand certain biases the brain has or just how the brain works along different contexts of human experiences, right? So we're talking memory, we're talking attention, we're talking decision-making, and then applying that to market. Because as consumers, as human beings, we like to think that we are in control of our own thoughts, particularly when it comes to <laughs> spending our hard-earned cash with a business. You, you, that was a very evil laugh, and the look on your face was like, yeah, good luck. What's really happening? Oh man, we, you know, there's a, there's a field called behavioral economics and it is literally the study of human irrationality. And that smorky hat on my face is, is, is because I recently spoke to one of my buddies who listened to a podcast by an economist and you talk to an economist, you know, and economists are like, no, we're logical human beings. We, we think everything through yada, 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 but we don't, you know, 
and so much so that there is an actual study of behavior sciences that is only dedicated to just how irrational we are and predicting irrationality. It's pretty wild. How irrational? I mean, I, I sort of know the answer to this question, but like, <laughs> how irrational are we? Like, what's the extreme example when it comes to a company selling us? Oh man, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Um, it's uh, over eighty percent of us turn right when we walk into a store. <laughs> right. Okay. No reason why. It doesn't matter if you're left-handed, right-handed, and that's an easy baby one, right? Irrationality, and we don't even notice we're doing it. That's one. So just hold on that thought, and I'd like to hear number two, but on that thought, applying that then as a small business, if I own a clothes shop and 80% of people are known to turn right as they walk in, what should I have on the right-hand side as they walk in? My best special or should I save that until they exit on the left? I think if I'm in that position, I'm testing two things. I'm testing the most popular products on the right, so it immediately captures the attention but that might result in them not checking out the rest of the store. So my second test would be testing the product that you have the most amount of uh, profit built into, right? So retail. So whatever is the highest profitable one, turn your, put, put that on the right side. Because it would be fair to say that as someone walks into a store, it's when they're probably most excited about going into that yes. store. I mean, it depends on the store, but yeah, that's probably, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Like you're, there's something new is about to happen. And yeah. I think, uh, you know, it, before we go down this journey, I think I want to introduce myself really why I think I know small business because I didn't set out to be an author. I did not set out to be a professor. This all happened in life and I calibrated and pivoted in those directions. I grew up wanting to be a brown Elon Musk for, better, for lack of a better term. <laughs> brown I wanted Elon to be Musk. <laughs> like it, being part of the Bay Area, you, you know, everyone wants to make X amount of money and, and then retire by the time they turn 25. Did not happen for me. But in the process, I was very lucky to work for lots of startups and small businesses. And I was always a behavior science, neuroscience, or psychology nerd growing up, even though that was not what I was formally trained in. And working for startups as a marketer very early on in my career, I used to read a lot of abstracts in neuroscience and psychology and go because you have a team, you know, entire company is 25 to 50 people. You're able to execute and test a lot of these things immediately. So I would study neuroscience, test, study, test, study, test. And uh, obviously, you know, fast forward 10, 12 years later, we're for small companies and larger companies. And a lot of that is what's in this book. So, you know, I, I want to make that point early because it is very easy to think neuro marketing. It just sounds so academic and you just need a, a small army. Well, that's slowly changing, right? That's slowly changing. I mean, you don't need a neuroscientist to explain to you the neuroscience of attention and how it works. You can just a, read Blindside or some of the other behavior science. Well, I, I guess, you know, as a term, it's pretty scary. And by the way, I'm sorry you yeah. didn't make your first gazillion by the time oh, you're 25 oh, and retire, but mate, come to you, you know, I don't know, even <laughs> at 45, it's still a good outcome. So, um, uh, you know, neuroscience, neuromarketing, all these terms that you're coming up with, I mean, to the average Joe are a little bit scary and daunting. And I, and I know by the end of this chat, it won't be. Right. Is, is it as simple as, just because I know you're going to give lots of examples and, and case studies over the course of this chat, but is it as simple as saying that, it, it sounds to me it is like trial and testing and, you know, putting things on the right-hand side of the store or if you're a restaurant owner going, hmm, okay, so everyone seems to be ordering from the top third of the menu. They're not making their way down, so therefore I should be stacking yeah. the top third of the menu with the good stuff. I mean, that's it, that's understanding of neuroscience at its most basic? It is uh, at, at the most basic. Because look, neuroscience is a study of human behavior in one way, shape, or form, right? And, and I realize small businesses wear 20 different hats, but one of the hats you wear is understanding your customer, whether it's to sell them more, whether to come back, or to satisfy them, or to market to them. Uh, and I think understanding little things like memory or attention uh, without being, without feeling like you're in a lecture hall with a pedantic professor, that was 100% our goal going into it. We want anyone who speaks English and reads English, pick up this book, be able to say, now I know how attention works. And then you can put together this toolkit and how you can apply it. And, and one of the things we talked about a lot in the book is anchoring. And I think that's a, a massive area where uh, small businesses can immediately test. And test is a key word. You're right. I love using that word because it's, uh, there aren't a lot of guarantees until you've tested them and you verify them. Then you can stand by them and that's a guarantee and that's what worked for me. And I think anchoring-based tests are really important. 
All right. Well, you need to explain that. You, mate, you are going to be – this is like a, a book of quotes, a, a geek's book of quotes. We're anchoring neuroscience, neuromarketing. What is anchoring? How does it apply to small business? How do we get more – how do we grow as a result of anchoring? Okay. So I will, I will, I will do the, uh, you know, the, the science bit so we understand what's happening and then, and then we'll give some tactics out there. Um, so the science bit is our, uh, our brains are like sailboats. We're looking for a place to anchor. Right? So we're always trying, your brain is constantly thinking it's a pattern seeking machine. And that is a, one of the few laws of brain of the brain that we can stand by a, it likes to put in minimum amount of effort and B it is constantly learning patterns more so as a kid, but it doesn't go away. And because of that, when you don't have a lot of information to grasp onto your, your brain is still going to look for stuff to come up with in the case of small businesses value of things, right? So MSRPs forever, and, and, and we should know this, right? MSRPs forever, when you know nothing about a shirt or this auto part or what have you, you see the MSRP. Hey, what's the it, first, MSRP, what's that? Sorry, I'm, I'm speaking American vernaculars. Manufacturer suggested retail price, uh-huh. right? It might not be the final price, but it's the price that is crossed out. And that is the first place your brain can find to put an anchor. Right. And, and, and an example that I give is of a department store in, in, in the U S doesn't matter what the brand is. They practiced um, fictional pricing. They didn't say that publicly, but 90% of their sales came from sale items. What does that tell you? It is always on sale. And, and they hired a new person to come in and they actually stole the retail designer from Apple. Gave them a lot of stock options to come in here. And he came out and he did one of the things that you don't get to see at scale is just brutal honesty from a, from a CEO, which was, he's like, look, we've been practicing fictional pricing for decades. Uh, we need to change that. We're going to get rid of this fake MSRP that is slashed out. And we're actually going to give you the, the price is the price. And in fact, we're going to drop that 10 to 20%. Did an entire PR campaign around it, everything around it. What happened? Sales dropped. No one's buying we don't want the truth. That, you don't want the truth. We want to be and manipulated. We want to be manipulated. It's, it's, it sucks. And then, they, of course, they brought, they brought the old pricing model back. Sales went back up. Everyone's happy. So that is because our brain is anchored. A sense of value is anchored to that. And then here's an example that literally anyone who sells a product that has multiple options can do. And we intuitively know this, right, Tim? You know the rule of three exists from photography to the number three is attractive. It's a great way to do small, medium, large. Well, we tested this. We tested this. Behavior economics has figured out that humans go for the middle option. If they know nothing else about anything else, they go for the middle option. And we intuit that as well as consumers and as small business owners. And that is something that we practice. We, you know, my, you know, one of the first startups that I worked at for for a very long time was an auto parts startup. And we did remanufactured, off brand new and OEM new. All that means is three different types, as opposed to a hand, like we used to have a lot of different options. And the option we really want people to buy was a middle option, priced in the middle, placed visually in the middle, uh, online and elsewhere. Well, it's a great example of those, you go to those online businesses and those SaaS products where they give you, and I'll just use the boring bronze, silver, gold option, but it's like, you know, the bronze is often the free version and they say, this is what you get. And then the middle one, here's the better option. And then there's the really expensive one. And Everything, I just look at it uh, from a marketer's point of view at those pricing tables online and everything they're doing is pushing you to that middle option, you know, visually, the colors, the fonts, the size, everything. And so that, that's an example. Just on, on, on that idea of, um, what do you call it, fictional pricing prints. Mm-hmm. So I just want to see whether we're on the right track here. So in Australia, we have Chemist Warehouse, it's the biggest chain of chemists and pharmacists. You guys call them drugstores, never understood mm-hmm. that. And uh, in Australia, and we also have JB Hi-Fi, which is our biggest sort of gadget store where you go to buy any electrical item, right? And their pricing is very crunchy, but visually every single price has a sale tag hanging off the shelf, right? Every single one of them. And it, it, the store is always, in my mind, and I'm sure everyone else listening to this, that both those stores are always on sale, are they really on sale or are they just manipulating the way we see pricing to think that is a sale price? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a sales tactic. It's a marketing tactic. Manipulation is tough though, right? Like I, I'm not trying to get stuck in a war of words, but like manipulation almost seems like it is forcing you to buy, right? And, and 
it affects your sense of value 100%. Uh, you can't do a luxury brand that always practices this type of value-based no. pricing, right? Yeah, like, because it's the other way around where you have to keep it inflated, even if it means walking away from revenue and volume. Um, so yeah, it works. And it is definitely for that exact reason. Pricing is a really interesting aspect of neuro. I didn't expect to have a long pricing conversation, but it's actually interesting because we don't do it a lot on this show. And 540 or episodes in, it's actually worth touching on because I know from my point of view, and I'm sure many listeners' point of view, arriving at price is hard. I had a guest on many years ago who ran a discount store and all his prices were like $8.82 or $20.33. And his view was that that, that looks like wholesale pricing. So it looks, you just instantly feel like you're getting a good deal. On the other hand, I went for a job many years ago as the director of marketing at Mercedes Benz in Australia. And I remember one of the questions uh, at the time was, do you think we should display our prices on our ads? So there's a luxury item mm-hmm. now. I can't. I, I think I got that question right. I think I said yes, you should. But and they, I think they do these days. But you know, as a luxury item, I'm not sure whether I want people to know what I'm paying. So it's quite tricky, isn't it? It is. It's tricky. And I, and, I, and I'll give another example of anchoring that isn't pick the middle choice because that feels intuitive after the fact, right? Think about going into the. We'll, we'll go with the Mercedes example, Tim. Going into buying a Mercedes, and you say you're picking up an E-Class or 50 grand or whatever it costs in Oz, or probably around 50K, 60K. The fact that they have the nerve to charge $800 for color, for paint, is comical. But also, what is $800 when it's anchored with a 60K price tag for a Mercedes? There's a reason why a $25,000 Toyota doesn't charge you for color, but that same Toyota with a Lexus badge might actually have a cost for that. And, and the reason, and that was brilliant, where the German car makers have been doing this for decades. They've been doing the package game and, and they, you know, the revenue stream isn't just the car for sale, it is all the packages, right? So if you want the moon roof and the cold seats, well, the, the moon roof is part of this other package that's 2K and the cold seats is part of the all weather package that's 4K. But at the end of the day, for buying luxury, you're anchored at the luxury price. So it's easier to sell add-ons for a luxury car because it's a $50,000 car and that's anchoring at work. Um, you can do that with something as simple as home appliances. If you have two bread makers, it's super random, but this is based on true case study, right? You have two bread makers and they're not selling well, but you have great profit on, on a bread maker. So you put the really expensive bread maker next to the one you want to sell, actually charge more for that. A $600 bread maker next to, but you change the price to 800 bucks and put it next to your $250 bread maker, your $250 bread maker is going to sell more because you're anchoring the price, even if it's the same brand. Geez, we're gullible. I'm starting to get annoyed at myself and everyone else. What are we missing here? We're going to take on these marketers. I need a podcast for consumers about how to take on marketers, not for marketers on how to take on consumers. <laughs> Look, I mean, we wrote the book for that reason. Sure. The book isn't directly written for marketers. It's, it, it was targeted towards consumers. And, and you know what's funny is it, it's almost a fictional fight, right? Like it's almost like this impression that won't go away. Marketers want to separate you from your money. And then, and then consumers have to, and yes, there's shady stuff happening. And we can talk about that, especially in the way tech works. Some, some tech products absolutely do. But at the end of the day, listen, if I believe in all the messaging and the way the store has sold me a pair of Nikes. Hey, happy days. Man, I got, I got value on that. Happy days. Like take my hundred bucks, give me these Nikes and make me feel better about wearing Nikes. And there is value there. And that value is lost when it's always all, you know, when, when we frame stuff like, oh, yep, just trying to separate you from your cash. No. Nike's make me feel good. Take my hundred dollars. That feels like a fair value. You, you mentioned a big brand in Nike, Prince. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the concepts we've ta- spoken about on this podcast over the years is branding. I think it's one of the most overused terms in marketing. We hear it all the time. I'm not sure everyone using the term knows what it means. My definition of branding is that it's an emotional attachment. And that, that's what you want to build between you and your consumer. I always talk, think about the idea that you know, a, a brand, if you're a farmer, is a hot iron stamp that you put on the back of a cow, which leaves an indelible imprint, right? Which is what you want to do with consumers. From your point of view, what is a brand and how does branding work? A brand is the activation of a series of neurons that lead to an association with a company. Okay, that's, that's the professor answering, right? At the end of the day, a brand is an association of things. 
right? So Nike is associated with the demigods of, of athleticism. Under Armour is associated with the underdogs of athleticism. Apple is clean, minimalistic. Razor is crazy, apeshit, everything goes. Those are associations. Those associations aren't just associations that exist in the marketing world. Those are associations that brand managers have been able to create. And there are neurons that activate based on how strong the association is. So Coke equals happiness. Corona, not, not COVID, Corona the beer used to equal beach. These are associations that were created. And we talk about association design in the book quite a bit. So to me, as a neuromarketer, uh, a brand is those associations. Can I, can I just ask, again, representing the small guy, so mm-hmm. I get the Corona beer advertising because it's beautiful. Like those, those guys spend a lot of money, certainly in Australia, on outdoor advertising with beautiful beach surf scenes, people drinking beer at sunset with the tagline from where, you, where you'd love to be or something like that. Uh, no, yeah. Spend a lot of dough. Nike spent a lot of dough sponsoring the Tiger Woods of the world. Okay, so their, their ability to associate with third-party things that they don't actually own, they're just getting the rub off, is easy because mm-hmm. they spend a lot of dough. How can a small business owner use association in order to build their brand? Excellent question. I think a small business owner should focus on the product itself whether you're selling auto parts on the internet or you're a restaurant or you're a car mechanic, what is your product? Focus on the core product to deliver a ton of value. There's a lot of people reselling the same water bottle, Red Bull, whatever that may be. So how are you providing value besides that? Focus on that. Because while you know we don't have the millions of dollars to create association design with celebrities, but you can still associate your product with a better experience. So a lot of what I said is dependent on the actual type of product as well, like, or, or the company, right? What they're into, but going from a brand focused mentality to a product focused mentality is more likely to lead to word of mouth, which is sort of branding. So you're suggesting be product focused as a small business in order to associate, but I thought branding was a great point of difference because you have a lot of influence over how you brand something with a product. For example, there's no shortage of cafes. There's no shortage of masseurs. There's no shortage of chiropractors. So it's very hard to just differentiate yourself mm-hmm. on the basis of product or am I missing something? No, I mean, it, it's, it's hard, but it is also something that small businesses have to do in a, in a crowded market, right? So the cafe example, I love that example. Because you think cafe one in a million, you've been to one, you've been to all of them. And especially if you're sourcing the coffee beans from the same thing, but the experience does not have to be the same. And that can be a differentiator. So when we're talking objectively, the product is a coffee you're serving, but really the product is the entire touch point from walking in, getting coffee, leaving. So what can you do there to differentiate yourself? That's investing in the product in the same way. And of course, that is what differentiates. And, and, and by product, you used, used air quotes. Um, you're talking about a service, um, a physical product. Um, and the customer experience thing is so important, isn't it? Again, we've touched on this on the show. And one of my most popular episodes was with a fellow who owns an electrician franchise, and he's created a 21-step customer mantra that every one of his electricians must follow every time they go on site. Very simple steps, but if you add all 21 up, it's the most awesome customer experience. He develops loyalty, emotion, and he's got a brand. That's what we're talking about, right? Absolutely. Do you you have a a process? I'm just putting on the spot here, but all my questions are here to put you on the spot, Prince. Do you have a process that small business owners could use to develop a customer experience? Yes. I think we can get real granular. Sit down and think about all the possible touch points, okay? And and, and from all the way down from accounting, if they have to interact with suppliers, all the way down to sales, to service. And and a lot of times people bypass service because no one that's after sale and it's customer service and it's, it's icky, it's icky. No, there's insights hiding in there. Think about all those touch points and then think about what your company is selling. Think about how you can be more memorable and we can talk a bit about that. Actually, let's talk about that now. I'll give, I'll, give, I'll give one memory hack right now that applies to experience. Memory is, in a word, a trip. What we think our memory, you just hit record, 
you record what's happening, you hit play, and then forever and ever until you die, you can hit play and get remembered exactly how it is. Absolutely not. Your brain is remixing your memories depending on multiple different factors every time you replay them, okay? But in order to be memorable, there are two research-based hacks, so to speak. Let's just say you have an experience, you know, from point A to point B, whether it's a phone call, uh, whether it's walking in and out of a store, point A to point B. The part that we weigh heavily in grading said experience is twofold. One is the peak of the experience. And it's hard to say if that comes the beginning, middle, end, act one, act two, act three. And two is the very end, okay? So if you want to optimize for a better memory and a better experience, you better make sure the very last touch point from that A to B is optimized for a positive experience. Interesting. Secondly, test for a peak in A to B. Um, you know, I've, I've used that in my TED talk. I've used that when I'm advising. I've used that in my classes when I'm teaching. I've used that with my clients. And it's simply taking this little bit about memory and seeing how you can test different ways in your retail or online experience. And, and I'll give you one example. It's a, it's a crappy electronics company, but it's super popular in the States. And you go in there and you feel like a criminal because there's no customer service. You can never find people there. It looks like a bomb went off in there. There's nothing to do. And then when you buy something and you walk out, the first thing they're doing is checking to make sure you didn't steal anything as you exit. And this is, but it's a value <laughs> store, right? Sounds like most department stores in Australia. Well, there you go. My peak is not being able to find anything. That's the peak of my experience. And the end of my experience is someone double checking to make sure that I didn't steal anything. And that is my last impression. I, I'm wanting to hear what they're doing right. Uh, I mean, discount prices, I guess, right? Like if you want to, if that's what you have to do to compete, that's a race to the bottom considering they're not the ones making the product, right? They're the middleman. And compare that to, I know I hate to use the example because it's, it's kind of kitschy, but Apple, what's the last feeling you get is when you just walk right out or Amazon stores. Uh, I don't know if there's one in Oz yet, but there's one in San Francisco and you literally walk in and there's not a single person there. That's a peak that's in your head and you grab what you want. It shows up on your checkout and you walk out and there's not even a human being to check out with. So the, so the end is this crazy frictionless experience that you walk out and that gets buried in your head. Again, for small businesses, you don't clearly, you, only Amazon has been able to execute on that. But nonetheless, it's the concept of you got to have a good way to end the movie and you got to have a really great moment during the movie. Well, fortunately, a recent guest is Jeff Bezos's right-hand man or shadow, a Colin Breyer, I think his name was, and he uh, talks to us about the Amazon process of working backwards. So we can, as of now, go back and listen to that episode. I love it. Hey, are you a bit freaked out yet? <laughs> if my chat with the world's leading neuromarketing expert is inspiring you to create some great marketing to grow that beautiful business of yours, then I encourage you to grab a copy of my popular book, The Boomerang Effect, that shows you how being helpful in your marketing returns you more customers and makes you more money. ka -ching! You can grab a copy over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Now, back to Prince. Or maybe that should be back to the Prince of Darkness. There's a question, Prince, that I am very excited to hear the answer for, for because the OCD in me uh, looks at watch advertising and sees every single watch in every catalogue and in every jewellery store window and every TV ad, the watch is set at 10 past 10. Can you please, please finally let me know why that is? Yeah, I'd love to. So the business objective of that time is, here's the question. How many different times can we show on a watch so that the brand shows and possibly if the model, Right. But there are many times, not just 1010, 10, that you can do that with. So studies have shown when you show 1010 10 instead of maybe 820, right? Because it, ultimately, it's the inverse of that. 1010 um, 10 leads to more sales and a, a better impression of the product. And the theory is because it resembles a smile. No. Yeah. Simple as that. It shows the brand. It looks like a smile. It looks friendly. Yep. Gee, we're simple creatures. I'm getting more and more, more and more annoyed with human beings as uh, we go through this interview. Now, tell me, um, McDonald's. Why red and yellow? Oh man, great, great one too. So again, this is behavior. So it's hard for me to say definitively. I'll tell you a study. 
they put people in, um, in three different rooms and they, had, they gave them soup. Drink this soup, take your $20 for research, thank you very much. One was the stock soup color, one was green, one was blue, one was red. The, the room with the blue soup was uh, the least appetizing reported, the least satisfying. Was the soup blue or was the, the room blue? The, the soup, soup was blue. Okay. They've actually done this with room and lighting as well and similar results. So blue is an appetite suppressor and red rooms resulted in eating the most or drinking the most, right? Only McDonald's knows for sure, but I'm willing to bet that red makes people a little bit more hungry. Um, and then the yellow one, it's a theory, but it, there's a friendliness attached to red. So you've got th those two things combined. And I tried really hard to find a fast food, you know, a, a branded fast food restaurant that has, that does not have red or yellow. And it's really tough. Well, Subway. Subway has yellow. It's yellow and green. It has yellow. Yeah, it doesn't have green. red. Yeah, it does not yeah, have yeah, red. Yeah. There's always one of those present. So, I mean, here's the thing. is ultimately somewhere inside of their archives that did the consumer research and know why. It's hard to go, hey, I want to raise a bunch of money to do research to figure out exactly why Mickey D's uses red or yellow. But there have been analogous studies where you can extrapolate that. Like the, we know that we don't like blue food. Hence, not a lot of fast food restaurants use mm. blue. Uh, we know oh. that red tends to get us to eat more. So go figure. People, people sell blue refrigerator bulbs if you want to hack yourself to, <laughs> to, a, to a healthier you. Yeah. We are talking to uh, Prince Gooman, who is the author or co-author of a book called Blindsight, uh, which is a fantastic read. If you do nothing, if you don't read the book, just read the comments in Amazon. They're fantastic. <laughs> Say to my producer, Dave, before we went on air, some of the people who go to the, the trouble of leaving this most amazing reviews, they're all like, almost like mini theses. Thank you. Know. you. I love it. Like, <laughs> we had, like One Amazon review is from someone who is a, a doctor. And, uh, yes. and took a neuroscience of pain class, which is not me. I'm not, a, I'm not a clinical anything. And then the fact that the review was reflecting, just piggybacking off of, oh, the neuroscience of pain and how much so much of this stuff is perception Brilliant. and psychosomatic. And, and now I can totally see how this ties to my consumer behavior. That was a massive, I would have never in a million years expected that. In a million years. Wow. You can't buy that. Well, maybe you can. Maybe you yeah, did. Anyway, that's know. another story. <laughs> Tell us about the font prints, Vedana 11. Uh, Verdana 11. So, so I, I got to set this up for the listeners, right? Verdana is one of the common fonts, like Times Roman, Verdana, Ariel. Those are some of the common fonts we read. And the reason why Tim's bringing this up is because a little thing called friction. And, and you don't have to be a user experience designer to think about friction. Friction is typically considered a bad thing. If you're checking out on your website or your retail location, if you add too much friction, it's a bad experience. And then again, it's a bad memory. So an example of friction is um, you've got to do, get three clicks in order to get something in the shopping cart, for example. Exactly, exactly, right? So you add more, or you have two clicks, but you've got a form that has 24 different entries instead of 12. Nonetheless, all that's friction. And we bring this up about fonts because a really fascinating study came out that compared simple fonts, easy to read fonts, such as Verdana and Times Roman, um, with a very specific, harder to read font. So you're actually actively adding friction and something very shocking happened. The exact same passage written in the harder to read font was remembered a lot better in memory tests and scored higher in comprehension tests. So what does that tell you? Although friction is usually the rule is to avoid friction in the customer experience, makes sense to me. But if you want to optimize for memory, perhaps you add friction and it doesn't have to be a negative bit of friction. Like, Increasing the checkout is negative bit of friction, but uh, instead of paying, you know, some people do advertise uh, at a train station and, and that stuff has gone down lately in price. So maybe it is something that you could test, but something that people typically do is, you know, I sell musical instruments. Here's a billboard. I sell musical instruments. Hopefully buy them. Or you can paint the piano keys on a staircase and have people tap on them. That's friction in that sense. And that friction will help remember your musical instrument store that much more as opposed to a billboard, which we are programmed to ignoring as much as we can. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't say, I, I, I love, I think I might've seen steps painted as piano keys. And that is, it's sort of like a, a sort of a guerrilla marketing type mm -hmm. setup. I, didn't, I don't see that as, as, as adding friction. Is it friction because it's, it's not overtly saying buy from my store. It's actually sort of giving you, it's sort of anchoring or it's a brand awareness exercise. It's friction because it is, asking you to apply. 
Uh, Even I, though it's something as it's a, it's a call to action without being a call yes. to action. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. opposed to a billboard that call to action is call me, go on this website, whatever. You're making me take an action physically. That's friction in that sense. You're making me pause and think and do something. That amplifies memory. And just to close the Vedana 11 question, you're saying is Vedana 11 the least, is, is, is frictionless? No, the, yeah, that's, that one's frictionless. Vedana 11 is the control, and you really want to think about sans for Getica. Ah, uh, okay. It's a different one. Yeah, so they, they compared simple fonts like Verdana to sans for Getica, and sans for Getica, this was at MIT, and sans for Getica was the one that, was, that helped remember more. See, that's a, it's a great example for a small business owner listening. They would never give any thought to fonts. And now, but maybe there's a handful that are going, oh, yes, Timbo, we do, we do, but the majority don't. And I'm sure there are still a, a few out there who create brochures using Comic Sans, which is actually now a criminal offence in Australia. Uh, you get locked. <laughs> it's, it's five years for using Comic Sans in any form of marketing. Oh, but it's just – that's a really interesting example because I do see small business owners sending out email or printing brochures for letterbox drops using wacky, scrolly, italicised, bold, different size fonts, different fonts, and it's just like, hey – is it, okay, a little bit of friction might be okay according to Prince, but stop trying to be too clever. That's a lot, yeah. And that's the, and, and since we're on the topic, Tim, that's one of the things you often see, and it's easy to fix. Stick to one font family. If it's an email, one font family. If it's a brochure, one font family. You can play with italicized or bold, and you have to have a hierarchy. You look at your newspaper, you know, the most important stuff is the biggest and these important stuff is the smallest and it's in the top to bottom in the F reading pattern is what we call it, right? That's because that's where our attention naturally goes to. So the stuff you want to get the most amount of attention toward should be at the peak of the F. And as you read, you go further down, but you got to stick to the same font because people might look at a brochure and go, I don't like this company or it doesn't seem professional. And it doesn't matter if you have 100,000 reviews on Google and you're amazing at being the best plumber in, you know, in Brizzy. But at the end of the day, if the brochure doesn't re represent that, it's a feeling. And, and a lot of times, people don't know why they feel this way. They don't know why they like it. Unless they're a UX person, they don't know that. But it has that impression. So one easy hack is stick to one font family per medium. Good learning. Prince, if you were to open a business today, just saying, what would the top three neuromarketing initiatives be that you would put in place? Ooh, okay. Give me a product or give me like, give me a lane and I'll answer that. Uh, you, you, you're going to open up a marketing consultancy. You could do that. You know that off the back of your hand. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to use one font. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to use this. And this is based on something that I actually did do at a small, small business. I would use photos of humans. Mm -hmm. And that sounds so, I don't know, unsplashy. But we sold auto parts. And when we changed photos of just all the auto parts and cars to photos of people and mechanics, conversion rates went up. So that's one. Wherever you can, mm -hmm. do that. Uh, secondly, I would create, and you don't have to be a big company with a hotshot sponsor, something as simple as I'm the CEO and I have something to say. I would find one person within the company that will be the face of the company. You don't have to have press for this to be important mm. because humans have and this is a whole other conversation as well, Tim, but, but, but I'll, I'll summarize it like this. We empathize with singular things more than plural things. We connect more with singular things and plural things. The big brand example is you have a box of cereal and you sponsor the entire Australian swim team. That's going to connect less than if you picked one swimmer, one gold medalist out of the entire team to sponsor. Hmm. And, and what, I'm, what I'm using is I'm using the, the psychology behind that to create one person who's always going to be the face of the company because then my customers and my suppliers and everyone's empathy will be directed toward this one person. That makes so much sense because I've, I've looked at I, – I, every now and then I've seen sponsorships where it is a whole team and it just – you know, your brain doesn't know where to go with that, whereas if it's one individual, you go, okay, I can either buy into that person uh, or I can't. Uh, is, is there a third thing you'd put in place, Prince? I know it was a question. I'll put you on the spot here, but, you know, it's quite interesting hearing from the master. I'll, I'll, I'll do another one. If you have products that are really popular and then you have products that are not popular, but uh, you're confident that people would buy more if they know more about them, I would sandwich them between popular known products. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Again, the science behind it is this. I mean, I'll ask you, do opposites attract or birds of a feather? Which one do you prescribe to? Birds of a feather. Birds of a feather. Well, <laughs> to, to get the most amount of appeal, it's got to be a balance. That's what science is showing. So you can't be new, 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 new all the time. Uh-huh. And you can't be same, same, same all the time. Is because to, if you really want to optimize for mass adoption, you have to have new, but not so much new that it feels unsafe. So you want new and safe. We talk about all this in the book. So new and safe. So the new part is a part that people don't know. The safe part is stuff that you definitely know people know. So sandwiched in the bread of safety, you can sell more or get more adoption for newer products. Yeah, I love that. Uh, we live in crazy times, Prince. COVID has affected consumer behavior in many unpredictable ways. And, you know, maybe ways that, hey, it's about time, you know, doctors could do teleconsults, for example, versus us always having to go into the surgery. So that's a great, I think it's a great add-on. Which new behaviours do you see as being permanent as a result of COVID? Ooh, I've been thinking about this quite a bit. I think, you know, e-commerce jumped from whatever it was, 16% of all retail and it doubled to over 30. Uh, And this was in June of 2020, right? So we know it's gone up. I don't think that's changing. I think COVID has fast-forwarded that behavior irreversibly. I think that it has changed our consumers' adoption of anything tele. So you're right, telehealth is not going back. We're only going to the doctors for stuff that they actually need us there for in physical place. And what I think is going back to the antithesis of your question, I think that when COVID goes away and we're all vaccinated and living happily ever after, I think we're going to go back to experiences. Because, and it's not just this pent up demand to be out of the house. Think about what had been happening. Um, you think about the music industry or, or, you know, people were paying more for concerts than they have, than we were for CDs. For 10 bucks a month, you get every song made ever in the history of mankind. And yet that's why, you know, and then the revenue shifted from album sales to that. We've seen the New Yorker, it was a popular magazine, do a festival. Can you imagine a hundred year old? No, but... They do. And, and, and so people are reinvesting in experiences and there's pop-up restaurants and pop-up stores and branded experiences. That stuff sticks. And I think pandemic is the ultimate breaker of all predictions. But that stuff I do see going back a bit more. I think one day. I think one day. I do. I do. But the, uh, the e-commerce isn't. We've fast forwarded 15 years, I think, especially if you look at the telehealth and telefitness industries, we've fast forwarded 15 years and that's not going back. Well, Prince, awesome conversation, mate. A bit eye-opening, mind-opening. Um, we started our chat talking about, you know, are there really people in boardrooms plotting and planning to get inside our heads? It sounds like there are, but not boardrooms any everywhere. It also, uh, it feels like as small business owners, whilst we might not be able to afford someone in a white coat come into our business and, you know, create some neuromarketing, some of the stuff that you talk about or a lot of the stuff you talk about in Blindsight is going to enable, it will enable the small business owner to apply some pretty funky thinking to the way they grow their business. Absolutely. And then the key word is testing is once you understand the basics of neuromarketing and the word just gets normalized in your head, it's really just science of engagement. And, and I really urge, it is not written to be pedantic at all. I tried very hard to not sound like a professor. Matt and I both did, who's a neuroscientist who helped, who wrote the book with me. We did not want to be pedantic. We want everyone to pick this up and be like, oh my God, I understand myself better. I understand neuroscience better. And for small business owners, the hard part is going to be the testing. It won't be the science because the book is already there. And each chapter reads like its own independent book. So each, each chapter is memory, attention, experience, senses, music. It's a, it's a great book. You can, you can actually dip into it. You don't have to read it from start to finish. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to go and have a read of it. Blindsight, go to Amazon, maybe go to your local bookshop if you've got one and buy it. Prince Gurman, neuromarketer extraordinaire, thank you for joining us on the Small Business Big Marketing Podcast. Tim, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Well, there you go, team. World-leading neuromarketing expert, Professor Prince Gurman. I knew I was in a dodgy industry. I should have listened to my (laughs) mum. Hey, I encourage you to grab a copy of his new book, Blindsight. It really is a great read. A bit like myself. Okay, here's my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Professor Prince. 
Attention grabber number one. Now, call me naive, but I'm left a little horrified by some of the tactics he talked about. I've been in marketing for over 30 years and I can honestly say, hand on heart, I've never sat in a boardroom and discussed some of the neuromarketing concepts Prince shared. Have you? Love to know if you have. Attention grabber number two. I love the question he posed around how can we make our businesses and brands more memorable? It's a question that comes up time and time again on this podcast, or at least the answer to that question comes up time and time again in all different forms because some of my guests do some really funky stuff when it comes to making their brands or their businesses memorable. Hopefully you've picked up some along the way. And attention grabber number three, I'm wrapped to finally have the answer to why the time on watches in ads is always, always 10 past 10. I can now sleep soundly. Well, that's what grabbed my attention. I would love to know what grabbed yours. Hit pause and tell me by calling the Small Business Big Marketing Hotline on 0480 015 150, just like Chris did. Hey, Timbo, it's Chris Sullivan from your local tyre truck. Mate, there's many, many uh, marketing wins I've had from the podcast, but a couple that stick out for me is uh, definitely the video aspect. So we use video in our business for for thank yous after a sale. We use videos for quoting. If someone calls up and wants to know some information about a tyre, we send them a video of us displaying a tyre and talking to them with their name face-to-face. That's worked really well for our business and such a good pickup from from the podcast. Now, another win that we've had is being helpful. This is probably the most important part of any business where we're at the stage now where we put being helpful first. All the best and thanks very much for your information on all these podcasts. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time to ring the hotline and for being a long, long, long long-time listener of my podcast. If you've bought my book, you've been a really active contributor in the Small Business Big Marketing Facebook tribe. So thanks, mate. uh, You're a motivated business owner, and that's awesome. Video-wise, what I'm going to do, and Chris has had some great success with video. I've seen some of the ones he's done. I'll put a list of episodes over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 540 of all the people that I've spoken to over the years who have helped provide tips around video marketing. And Chris, helpful marketing, yep, you're you're nailing that as well, mate. And for anyone else who'd like to nail it, grab a copy of my book over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. It's called The Boomerang Effect and you will learn how to be a helpful marketer. Next episode, we get an update from Flow Hive's Cedar Anderson, who appeared on this show a couple of years ago. Now, Cedar is a Byron Bay hippie, along with his old man, who have completely disrupted the beekeeping industry and made a gazillion dollars along the way. Now, what turns out to be quite a revealing chat, Cedar shares how he's taken his business from strength to strength since we last caught up. And I can tell you now that Cedar rolled up to my interview with him in a paraglider. (laughs) He landed in the backyard of his office on a paraglider. I'll tell you more about that in the next episode. Be sure to grab a copy of my book, The Boomerang Effect, over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you are loving the podcast, then you'll find 539 more episodes. As has been the case for the past 12 years, this podcast is presented by me, Timbo Reid. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. May your marketing be the absolute best marketing. Bye for now.